in several ways, I think the most startling and most original aspect of the Principia, oddly, one might think, is in its final book, in book three, as it now is, this on the system of the world, because um, it might have been expected, it was expected from 17th century mixed mathematics and cosmology, that one would seek to construct a system of the world which meant describing the movements of all the satellites and planets uh, in orbit around the sun and uh, the satellites around the planets. Um, there were limits to what one might be able to spell out there, but certainly there was a lot of quantitative data from astronomical observations of planets and moons. And there were some very powerful and extremely effective qualitative natural philosophical accounts of the causes of such motion, perhaps vortex motion, as in the case of the Cartesians, um, or some kind of overbalancing force in the case of Giovanni Borelli in the 1660s. But what was extraordinary, surely, about the third book was that it moved far beyond a cosmology of satellites, of moons, of planets, and of the sun. Um, it included, first of all, the movement of the sea, of the tides, this was the first mathematical model of tidal movement globally. It was extraordinarily successful, um, and it included, uh, just in passing, uh, the first description of wave interference in the case of the strange and remarkable tides that East India Company pilots had observed in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of Vietnam. Secondly, um, just as in book one, Newton had been able to show that if gravity varies as one over the square of the distance, then one can consider the force of an entire sphere as if it were acting from its centre. So in the third book, he was able to develop those kinds of approaches to show that um, one could determine the exact figure of the Earth by measuring variations in the force of gravity at its surface. And the obvious way to do that for Newton was to measure the rate at which pendulums moved, because as had been shown, um, the rate at which a pendulum beats responds to the acceleration due to gravity at that point on the surface of the Earth. So by measuring the rate at which pendulums beat, in other words, carrying pendulum clocks around, you could in principle derive the shape of this planet. That was astonishing. And then finally, in the closing propositions of the third book, a, a radical new account of cometary motion. Radical for Newton too. Until 1680, 81, Newton um, had certainly not extended anything like a gravitational model to the motion of comets. But from 1681, 1682, he did. So that in 1686, 7, when he was composing uh, the version of the Principia that was published, um, in the third book, he included propositions that demonstrated, again to his own satisfaction, that comets move in orbits that have the shape of conic sections, hyperbolas, parabolas, or above all, ellipses, that they are periodic, that they are subject to the law of gravitation, that they are pulled on by the sun with a force that moves as, that changes as one over the square of the distance, and that they can be considered exactly the way satellites and planets are. So the unification of the whole of cosmology from phenomena of this world, its shape, the way the pendulum beats, the motion of the tides, to the most remote cosmological questions, including the fixity of the stars, the motion of comets. That, I think, would have been and was absolutely startling to Newton's readers.